Good evening. Thank you everybody for coming in such a bad weather. Um, I'd firstly like to request everybody to switch off their mobile phones. Uh, now, for those of you who do not know, IMAP is actually an art and theater archive, a digital archive. But since of this year, we started to work on a value-based social dialogue for public spaces because we saw the need that dialogue is required. There's a need to talk about it because there's a lack of public space. And of course, just this week we had an earthquake and all of us know how necessary space is. Anyways, so I am welcoming you all to our first lecture series, the IMAP lecture series, which is Why the Need for Public Space by John Sandy. Now, Kathmandu is not just our capital, it is also the center for all activities where we have our culture, our politics, our social, our economy, and our technology happening all in the hub of the center of the country. Many of us grew up here, many of us have worked here, many of us have moved to the city and lived here for a very long time, and we've had a very much strong emotional attachment to this city, and many of us have witnessed the changes the city has gone under. Now, I speak for all of us, I hope, but when we look at our city and how our city has changed, it is kind of very tragic and sad to see that from such an elegant space, it's actually turned into, an, um, into a very, very embarrassing state. Um, for instance, public spaces is just a namesake. There is basically no public space. Most public space is either cordoned off, most public spaces are occupied by either private bodies or government bodies or who knows who. And also, we as people, we as not just the citizens and the dwellers of Kashmir, but we live in pigeon homes. And it is really, really sad. And I do believe that we've taken the initiative to discuss public space, and I do believe that it is really, really high time that we ask why, how did we allow this to happen? How can such a pretty city like Kashmandu, that it used to be, such a beautiful, such a glorious city like Kashmandu, actually turn into such a tragic thing? I would like to call it a thing because it doesn't seem like anything else. <laughs> Anyways, to shed some light on today's uh, lecture is John Sandy. He's a British architect who's worked for 35 years or so in Nepal itself as well as in other countries in Asia. He's very well known and very much revered in our country. Um, he is uh, the chairman of the multidisciplinary architecture practice John Sandy Associates, also the regional director of Global Heritage Fund of Asia Pacific and has been then awarded an OBE for his contribution to world conservation. He's worked in many conservational sites in Asia. Am I correct? <laughs> Today he's going to share his experiences in Nepal, India, Cambodia and other Asian countries, mainly focusing on Nepali spaces. So I leave the floor to John Sandy. And before that, the lecture is about 45 minutes, and then we'll have a half an hour session for question and answers. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're going to get off the podium now. <laughs> well, good evening. It's a great, great pleasure to... Oh, do I have... I put this one. No, no, it's okay. It's a great pleasure to be the first speaker, and uh, again, it's great to see so many faces. Uh, I have to admit that I was given very short notice to talk about uh, spaces, and so for the last week I've been thinking very hard about spaces, and what happened when I started thinking was I thought, well, I'll go back to my early slides, my early pictures. 35 years ago, or more in fact, in 1971 when I first came. And I dug them out because there were the places that I remember as spaces. And uh, as uh, our friend was saying, it's very, very important to have space. There are spaces. It's just a question now of being able to win them back. And so what I thought we'd do uh, today is really to take you on my journey over the last 35 years through Nepal, and then to hit at the very end 
one of the most important spaces, I think, which is the Tecutapatali. And this is a project that, or a, an area that we've spent a lot of time and energy with a group of people from Bristol University putting up a proposal. And the book is somewhere, yes, here, the great um, report on Tecutapatali. And we feel very strongly that this is still very active. It upset me enormously because obviously I had to go and do a bit of research in the last week in the pouring rain. And I wandered down to the very end, the Teku end, which is the area that I remember so well. And I went into one of my favorite temples and it was all falling apart. And that actually fired me up. And I spent the last two or three nights putting together a series of slides really to get the, you know, get the, uh, uh, your minds thinking about how on earth can we start regaining a lot of these public open spaces. I'm showing examples and as we go through I'll make comments. Unfortunately the, the computer here doesn't have my notes on it so I'm really literally talking off the cuff. So please if I make any mistakes bear with me. So why? Why the need for public space? And that's something that I find very difficult to answer to start with, because when I first came, you didn't need public space. It was there. It was, why, why are we lacking public space today? Two basic reasons. One, cars, vehicles because they've taken over a lot of the spaces. They're, I mean, all roads are public. A lot of these roads used to be pedestrian areas. And the second, buildings. The influx of literally hundreds of thousands of people coming in from all directions, and they need somewhere to live. And so we start getting more and more buildings coming in. And this is really the major problem, because What's happening is a lot of these buildings are being built really without any permission. And I've got a few examples which I will show you um, as we go through. So to start with, find the right button. I wasn't around at this time, but it's such a wonderful picture. Can we turn the lights out? Maybe they'll be stronger. But this is one of the earliest pictures I've seen of Kathmandu, um, dating, I think, from about the 15th, 16th, 17th century. But it's a, it's a nice way of thinking about Kathmandu because no cars and uh, all rather nice looking buildings. I remember my first journey into Kathmandu, into the valley. And all I remember were these little pockets of villages, communities, in a very, very uh, wonderful green scenario, the valley. <clears throat> and then this is the first picture I took of Bodnaf. And it's unreal to go there, as I have been in the last few days, and realizing what development, so-called development, has done to something that was so pristine and something that I remember going and walking, you know, walking there and walking around and walking back home. It's the last thing you want to do today. So these are a series of photographs that uh, really evoke the memories of Bodhna. This was the, really one of the very first of the new Gompas to appear, and everyone thought, this is terrible. You know, we'd given up by the time the Hyatt had turned up. And I'm not complaining, but I am saying is that these areas were designated as monument zones. And that's where, you know, in the early days, UNESCO, and in fact I was um, responsible for working on the nomination of the seven sites, creating a ring around them, a protective ring, a buffer zone, 
and it's just heartbreaking to see that none of those buffer zones have been in any way observed. People just buy and build, buy and build. And I mean, Bodnarth is really one of the great classic examples. You may remember the ring around Bodnarth, these wonderful houses, every single one was different. And they were the, the artisans. I mean, Bodnarth became famous um, well, it always has been, for uh, the artisans working around uh, and all the Tibetan people used to come in and buy from them. And now, slowly, there are very few of these houses still left. Tourism has taken over. No control. It's still a wonderful place to go and wander around, and I mean, it is a great public space. But it's changed so dramatically that it, uh, you know, it's one of those sad things about uh, having lived in Nepal for so long. Very soon after those earlier pictures, one became very much aware of the, um, the development that was taking place, but there's still a lot of green space around, which has now totally disappeared. Yeah, this is Kirtipur. Kirtipur, which was a little island, really, in the paddy fields. What happened? And I may be wrong, but my, I remember asking as to why, you know, um, Kirtipur just got completely swamped with development. University arrived, and I'm told, bought up this land around Kirtipur, which was very productive. It was a wonderful uh, place for growing rice. And so the local people basically lost their income from, uh, from farming and they had to think of other things to do. And I have one of my, um, my carpenters who's been working with me now for 15, 20 years. I showed him this picture yesterday and he looked at it and he said, my goodness, is that what it was like? And it is a grain, again, a, a great shame because it has such a, a very well-defined boundary. I mean, all this area is now totally overbuilt. And, I mean, one of the great charms about Kirtipur and I, was that it was basically a, a pedestrianized city and you had these wonderful buildings that you used to look through and you realized you were on almost either the first floor or the second floor because of the slope wonderful architecture and uh, some very very significant historic structures I mean the, the old palace and now it's very difficult to actually locate them why development uncontrolled development expansion, the need for further, uh, you know, for more places for people to live. And so, you're asking already, well, how are we going to change all this? Well, I hope, you know, in some of the areas we can do something. Um, I had a team of, of architects who came in from Bristol University, and they spent six months up there and did a very, very thorough study of Kirtipur, and I was, I only found this a couple of days ago, this wonderful view of Kirtipur as it used to be. 